funding for NJ Spotlight News provided by the members of the New Jersey Education Association, making public schools great for every child. RWJ Barnabas Health, let's be healthy together. And Orsted, committed to the creation of a new long-term, sustainable, clean energy future for New Jersey. From NJPBS, this is NJ Spotlight News with Brianna Venosi. Good evening and thanks for joining us this Monday night. I'm Brianna Venosi. Emergency crews from New Jersey are on the ground in Buffalo, New York, assisting in the rescue effort after this weekend's deadly winter storm, which buried Erie County in up to 50 inches of snow, leaving more than 30 people dead in and around the area. The fierce blizzard conditions blinded drivers, leaving them stranded in their cars, others trapped in their homes. According to a spokesperson for New Jersey State Police, 22 members of the state's Task Force One arrived in Buffalo this morning. The team is made up of first responders and engineers who have experience in disaster recovery dating as far back as 9-11. But this is the team's first out-of-state cold weather snow mission. Officials in Buffalo are still counting casualties in what's being called Western New York's deadliest storm in at least two generations. Military police today began enforcing driving bans in Buffalo to keep people off the snow-choked roads. The rest of the country is also reeling from the Arctic blast, which killed at least two dozen others across 10 states. Thousands of flights have been canceled nationwide. State officials tell NJ Spotlight News New Jersey emergency crews are expected to stay on with the recovery in Buffalo for up to two weeks, with other members at the ready if they're needed. Meanwhile, New Jersey is getting ready to shake the frigid weather that's been enveloping the region over these last several days. With temperatures expected to climb each day, forecasters predicting the state could reach a high of up to 60 degrees by New Year's Day. And that's a welcome break in particular for those who are unhoused and rely on New Jersey's Code Blue law to help them get shelter and other resources when temperatures turn extreme. But that system is riddled with limitations, according to a report by Ashley Balzerzak with NorthJersey.com, the Bergen record, and is instead leaving many vulnerable residents out in the cold. Ashley joins me now. Ashley, first of all, thanks for uh, joining us to talk about your reporting. You really looked into what it takes to get uh, someone who's unhoused off the street and into care that they need, particularly in the winter months um, and really frigid temperatures that we're in. And what did you find? So I got a call from a source of mine who was trying to get services for a man that he sees on the streets in Hackensack quite a bit. And the man who called me was also homeless in the past as well. So he really knew the different uh, resources to call, but he kept encountering different roadblocks um, when he was trying to reach um, 211, Code Blue, all of these different resources that we have in New Jersey, he was coming up short. So, I mean, essentially, does it show that these safety nets aren't working or that the systems of communications, I mean, you chronicled his many attempts to get his friend into a shelter, a motel, um, the hours he spent on the phone uh, with 211. Again, someone who is, we could say, savvy with the system, knowing uh, what roadblocks he might face. There are a couple of different issues here. So the first time that he was trying to get him help, we technically, Bergen County wasn't in this code blue designation, which basically is something that hits when it's 32 degrees freezing or there's a certain wind chill. And the Office of Emergency Management in the county, each county decides whether to call this, had not called it yet because it was the mid thirties. Now this designation opens up warming centers. So basically gives you like chairs in a shelter for someone to keep warm. But because that system wasn't open, he was denied after being on the phone for a while. Another issue just with these services in general is that you need a phone to, to, to reach these services like 211, which is the statewide right. helpline. And Matthew didn't have, the, the man who was experiencing homelessness didn't have a phone, it was stolen. So he had to rely on the kindness of a stranger to give him 
uh, his cell phone or to make the call for him. You, if you wanted to go to a warming center, if it was open in Bergen County, you can't just walk up. They're going to turn you away and say, call 211. So that's a hurdle that a lot of folks who don't have phones face during the cold months. Not just that, the transportation to get there. You wrote about the fact that he um, had a friend sort of advocating for, for him to get a ride with a willing police officer um, so that he wouldn't have to walk two and a half miles in the freezing temperatures. These are all sort of, I guess, fractures in this system that your reporting really points out. Exactly. So he was able to get a ride part of the way. Um, the police uh, officer couldn't go outside of his designated zone, so he got maybe halfway there and then found another hole in the system where there was some sort of miscommunication. Um, he was promised a room at a, a local motel, and by the time he got there, the person at the front desk told him that there was no room. We're not sure what happened there, but uh, he was not able to get a telephone to then call 211 to figure out what happened. So then he walked back to a place where he felt safe. So that was another hour of walking there, which is not how the system's supposed to work. Right. I mean, so ultimately, what did you find? Because it's not just a look at Code Blue and these safety programs for people, but really the mental health system in the state. What were you able to put a spotlight on here? Well, it's just a really confusing process. Uh, the other option that um, this advocate was trying to do for his friend was see, okay, well, maybe we could get him to a hospital. Um, there are some hospitals that maybe can give you a shower, a meal, that sort of thing. So he, he wanted to use that system called 262. It's kind of similar to what you may have heard about in New York with Eric Adams's plan to bring people involuntarily to the hospital. But you need to be having a sort of mental health episode. So even though the police were called to um, this man, Matthew, um, they must have said, oh, this man seems sane, he's he's okay, he does not fall under this system where we would have to involuntarily transport him to the hospital. So they went for, they talked to him for a couple minutes and then left according to public records. So that wasn't an option as well. Yeah, a lot there that needs to be looked at for sure um, in terms of that policy, both in New York and here in New Jersey. Um, Ashley Balserzak, thank you so much. The Bergen Record, NorthJersey.com. Thanks for sharing your reporting with us. Thanks for having me. Well, there's a new bipartisan push in Trenton to roll back changes made to New Jersey's bail system enacted five years ago under then Republican Governor Chris Christie, making the state among the first in the nation to effectively eliminate cash bail. The overhaul was designed to do away with so-called debtors' prisons. That's where low-income defendants wait trial because they can't afford to make bail. But the policy reversal is a stunning change for Democrats who championed reforms to the state's justice system, leaving some observers to question whether politics is at play. Senior political correspondent David Cruz reports. When Jersey City officials shared end-of-the-year crime stats recently, the news behind the headlines of reduced homicides and gun violence was less rosy. In almost all other areas, crime was actually up, they said. The reason, most likely officials say, was bail reform. Uh, lower level criminals being more emboldened and getting more emboldened as they discover the effects of bail reform, that they're not kept in for things they used to be kept in for. It's a story you've been hearing a lot nowadays. Crime is up. First it was the pandemic, and now it's bail reform. Democrats have now joined in the call for bail reform, Except to many observers, the data suggests that the crime wave is about as big as the red wave in the just completed midterms, which is to say, not much. There's this perception that without a presumption of detention, everyone is getting released. No one is being detained. But if you, you look on the judiciary website, you can see what the numbers show. And the numbers show that in more than 50 percent of cases where prosecutors request detention, they're getting it. So it's not that uh, prosecutors are abdicating their responsibility or judges are abdicating theirs. The system is working as it's intended. But with all the state legislature up for election next year, ginning up crime as an issue seems to be a bipartisan push. Democratic Senator Paul Sarlo says the uptick in car thefts over the pandemic years shows that a fix is needed. And criminal defense attorney and Republican Senator John Bramnick agrees. Their solution is legislation, like Sarlo's bill that expands the list of no-bail crimes and tightens rules on pretrial detention. 
the, the burden of proof should be on the defendant, not on the state to let them out. And that's why we're, I'm recommending we take a second hard look at bail reform. The statistics don't seem to bear out a, 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 a need to relook at bail reform, or do you disagree with that? There's no doubt that when you have repeated car thefts and police officers say that they don't go to jail even though they've stolen a car on two or three occasions, that's just common sense that we need to look at it depending on the crime. And the focus, rhetorically, and even in Sarlo's bill, has been auto thefts, which ticked up during the pandemic years, but has now started to dip again, according to the Attorney General's office. Shalom suggests that if there is a need for bail reform, the process to do that should be at least as deliberative as it was when this movement started back in 2014. I think the key to that is it came after a deliberative process. The Chief Justice called together the Joint Committee on Criminal Justice. Stakeholders from all sides came. We looked at numbers, we looked at data, and we came up with recommendations that ultimately became the statute that we're very proud of. But politics and elections will often trump logic and deliberation, notes another political observer. Before you throw it out, uh, for emotional reasons or for knee-jerk reasons, really for protective political reasons so that you don't want to be blamed in the upcoming elections for, you know, what's perceived to be an uptick in crime. Um, before we allow that to happen, we really ought to find out exactly what's going on. The bill is not yet scheduled for a hearing, but putting the burden on defendants to show that they're not at risk to flee or reoffend is the opposite of what the five-year-old reform bill was supposed to do. And that has reform advocates worried that the pendulum is swinging in the opposite direction and that it's powered by politics. I'm David Cruz, NJ Spotlight News. Well, the state's troubled women's prison is steadily improving conditions for inmates, but one main issue is still unresolved. That's the future of the century-old Edna Mahan Correctional Facility. Governor Murphy in 2021 pledged to close the Hunterdon County Prison following decades of reported abuses and a scathing review by the U.S. Justice Department, which cited violations of inmates' constitutional rights. Well, now, as 2022 comes to a close, advocates are pushing the state for answers on when and how that prison will be replaced. Senior Digital Projects editor Colleen O'Day joins me now with the latest. Colleen, as we come to the close of the year, a lot of the revelations at Edna Mahan are still not yet addressed, although progress has been made. What did you find in your reporting? You know, I think the big one, of course, is the facility. Um, the governor in June of 2021 announced that the facility, which is close to 110 years old, would be closing, but we still don't have any um, specifics about that. The corrections commissioner said in September that the consultant that the state had hired was pretty much close to, to finishing its job. And so that now we're told that report is complete. It's on her desk. It's um, just, you know, being reviewed and discussed within the department and I'm sure within the administration as to, to what to happen there. Uh, you know, we saw the problems there over the summer uh, when temperatures rose up into the 90s indoors and stayed there, uh, it prompted the facility to have to move a number of women over to a nearby closed youth facility, uh, move some other women into an air conditioned cottage on the ground. So uh, definitely that's something that, you know, should be addressed. I, I mean, I would expect to see recommendations fairly soon in the new year. Yeah, I mean, the department, correct me if I'm wrong, acknowledged from the get go that fulfilling Governor Murphy's uh, really promise to close the facility would take some time. So what else has been happening with the culture there? Because you and I know for decades there were reports of abuse, uh, sexual misconduct um, and other, uh, you know, alleged misgivings there. So that was one of the bright spots out of a report from the federal monitor. You know, the, the facility has been under federal monitoring now for about 16 months. Uh, this is due to the, the 
I mean, people called it a rape culture that was that was there for for decades. Um, uh, the Monitor's report, which uh, came out last month, shows that um, there has been quite a, an improvement in the in the culture there. Um, you know, the department has been trying to recruit particularly more women officers. Um, we don't have any we didn't have excuse me any high profile um allegations of rape or sexual assault that we knew about this year um which is certainly a good thing um the women who were interviewed by the monitor have really reported that things have improved of course they're not anywhere near where they need to be yet okay what else is still needed and what does the uh federal monitor cite as you know areas for improvement still so um, there are a few of them. One is the idea of keeping any uh, allegations of sexual assault private. That's supposed to happen under federal law. And women, staff, nobody there thinks that that happens. And that goes into another issue that needs to be fixed, which is retaliation, whether it happens or not. So if a woman makes an allegation against a guard of sexual assault, um, you know, there's this feeling again, whether real or not, that she's being retaliated against either, you know, being um, cited for for violations of, you know, minor offenses. Um, And then the final thing I think is that there needs to be better communications. The monitor found that um, sometimes the department doesn't know what the facility is doing. Sometimes within the facility, the administration doesn't know or the guards don't know. Um, So there's a lack of communications. Those those are kind of the three big ones, I think, that the monitor cited that still need improvement. All right, a story we will continue watching in 2023. Colleen O'Day, thanks so much. Thank you very much, Bree. For more details on the most recent federal review and future of Edna Mahan, check out Colleen O'Day's full story at njspotlightnews.org. And tonight, nearly one year later, the family of Felix de Jesus is still searching for answers. The 41-year-old Patterson man remains missing. He vanished last February, shortly after being detained by police. The last trace of his whereabouts is in a four-minute-long police body cam video released to the public that doesn't tell the whole story. Now his loved ones want state and federal law enforcement departments to take on the case. Senior correspondent Joanna Gagas reports. How can somebody just disappear after they were last seen alive in police custody and now we can't find them? Where is it? That question's been haunting the family of Felix de Jesus for nearly a year. De Jesus disappeared February 2nd after police took him into custody and later released him at a nearby park. The night began here at a Patterson bodega where a woman said he grabbed her. He's just drunk? Yeah, I don't know who he is. Listen, he just told me to act. He asked me to tell you what just happened. I told you. I just want to go back to my house. But what exactly happened that night remains unclear because the body camera footage from the arresting officers is incomplete. The footage starts with De Jesus already on the ground in handcuffs with no sound. The microphone then turns on and De Jesus can be heard telling police his hand was broken. It's broken. The footage later cuts off while he's still in custody. completed. Before police released him into Westside Park in Patterson wearing only a t-shirt according to the last video footage seen of him. If the cops would have never arrested my brother that night, my brother would have been back home. So you fault them for arresting him even though there was a situation where he was allegedly grabbing a a woman? Yes, uh, but actually I have direct contact with the woman. She didn't felt the harass or nothing like that. She didn't want to press on those charges. So they had to let my brother go right then and there. But they decided to put him in the patrol car and took him and they dumped them because that's what we feel. They dumped them in the park. It's a very dark spot. They don't have no lights. It was a cold blue weather. It was very cold and they just dumped them outside. It was snow on the ground. It was raining that night and they did 100% wrong. They broke protocol in in terms of cutting off the camera, okay, because the camera was supposed to continuously run. So somebody manually cut off the camera and, and that's the biggest problem because that that right there helps them in the cover-up of what happened to this young man. So that camera was not supposed to be turned off. The city has acknowledged the officer's wrongdoing. Taking into consideration those factors that he was intoxicated and that he was creating a disturbance, he should have been dropped off at the hospital. So 
The police officers exercised poor judgment. We took action. We've actually disciplined those police officers. However, I can assure you that we're still trying to find Felix de Jesus. The family, along with community activists like Corey Teague, have been showing up to city council meetings regularly, demanding harsher punishment for those officers. The city originally sought harsher punishment too, but Mayor Andre Sea says the three-month suspension without pay was an appropriate penalty. Yes, it is. Th th those are very stringent measures that were taken. Some might say that that does not send a strong enough message that an administration that is trying to enforce body cameras has not taken it seriously enough that someone shut off the camera and now there's a missing person. No, we, we stand firm in believing that we took the appropriate action. Saya also says he's been working closely with the Haldon Police Department that's in charge of the missing persons investigation because that's where De Jesus lived and that Patterson's offered a $10,000 reward. I'm offended by this 90-day suspension, even without pay. That was a major violation. This young man is missing, we don't know where he is, and the camera footage that we could have used in the investigation was turned off. So that, that doesn't help their case in terms of telling us that everything was, on, was above level. And the lack of transparency has created a breeding ground of distrust. My brother, uh, he was talking a little crap to them, so they maybe felt that some type of way or offended, and they probably heard of my brother and they trying to hide that. I would like and the family would like for the FBI to get involved and the Attorney General to get involved because I believe it's a cover up going on in Patterson. It's not the first time that this happened. It's a lot of brutality going on with the police of Patterson. But Saya says the investigation has discovered another lead that has nothing to do with the Patterson police. He was last seen with five individuals. One of those individuals remains a person of interest. In the meantime, the family is holding out hope they'll find De Jesus alive. I'm Joanna Gagas, NJ Spotlight News. The housing market's been a tough place to navigate for buyers since the start of the pandemic, but all signs are pointing to a return to normal next year. It's good news. Rhonda Schaffler joins us with the details plus tonight's top business stories. Rhonda. Brianna, 2023 could bring more stability to the housing market in New Jersey and elsewhere. We've already seen signs that sky-high prices are coming down to earth. The Case-Shiller housing report out this morning showed that home prices in the U.S. fell in October for the fourth straight month. This mirrors sales data from the National Association of Realtors, which has also shown consecutive months of declines. In New Jersey, the median sales price for a single family home was $470,000, according to the most recent data, down from $510,000 over the summer. Market watchers say home prices will likely continue to pull back next year, especially as mortgage rates have climbed. Days after announcing that Netflix is coming to the state, New Jersey is now sweetening incentives for film studio Lionsgate Films. The New Jersey Economic Development Authority has named Lionsgate as the state's first ever studio partner. That designation makes Lionsgate eligible for additional tax credits. Lionsgate is set to lease space at a Newark facility currently under construction. The $194 million project will include five production stages and is expected to be completed in the fall of 2024. Longtime PSEG executive Ralph Izzo is retiring at the end of this week. He's currently serving as executive chairman, helping with the transition as Ralph LaRosa took over running the company earlier this year. I recently sat down with Izzo and asked him what he thought his biggest accomplishment was during his long tenure. He named a few items. Number one, saving PSEG's nuclear plants. And number two, putting energy efficiency efforts, in his words, on steroids. I remember when I began, PSEG used to spend about 30 million a year in that regard. And now we're over 300 million a year. And number three, as we go through this transition, I do think that PSEG is doing a great job of making it what we call a just transition. We've made a huge emphasis on diversity, equity, and inclusion among our employees, among our suppliers. Now let's turn to Wall Street for a look at how the stock market closed today. I'm Rhonda Schapler and those are your top business stories.
And that's our show tonight. But make sure you head over to njspotlightnews.org and follow us on social media to keep up with all the latest news on the Garden State. I'm Brianna Venozzi for the entire NJ Spotlight News team. Thanks for being with us. We'll see you back here tomorrow. NJM Insurance Group, serving the insurance needs of residents and businesses for more than 100 years. New Jersey Realtors, the voice for real estate in New Jersey. More information is online at njrealtor.com and by the PSEG Foundation. Have some water. Sir. Look at these kids. How are you? What do you see? I see myself. I became an ESL teacher to give my students what I wanted when I came to this country. The opportunity to learn, to dream, to achieve, a chance to belong and to be an American. My name is Julia Toriani Crompton and I'm proud to be an NJEA member. NJM Insurance Group has been serving New Jersey businesses for over a century. As part of the Garden State, we help companies keep their vehicles on the road, employees on the job, and projects on track. Working to protect employees from illness and injury, to keep goods and services moving across the state. We're proud to be part of New Jersey. NJM, we've got New Jersey covered.